So this is uh, Watts Humphrey. You're 82? What? 81. 81, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, 45. Right, right. I hope I live that long. Um, so Mr. Humphrey worked for Sylvania in the 50s, and he worked on some computers on behalf of Infowage here. Uh, he's going to tell a story. The very, very short story is that this place wanted a univac and basically couldn't get one, as I understand. So he came to the rescue and built one. So how hard can it be? <laughs> so there you go. That's the lead off and uh, watch on free. Great. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and, and part of it, there's a, there's a bit of history here. There's a paper that I wrote in 1987, which seems awfully recent to me, but it's history to, to many of you. In any event, it's, it's written, it's in the uh, Annals of the History of Computing, and it's volume nine, number two. I've got the reference on the last page, and you may want to make copies of the talk available. Yeah, to people well, can I say want. one more thing? One sure, more please thing. do. Uh, I forgot to mention, I want to say. Um, so, about two months ago, I was doing some research for a whole different topic, and I stumbled across this article, and I said, wow, that guy sounds awesome. And we always knew there was a lot of computer history here at the way, Kim Evans. We never quite knew what. And I was reading this article, and it got to page so-and-so, and it specifically, he wrote, it said, the computer stuff was done at the Evans Singapore lab at Fort Monmouth, which is this place. And I said, wow, I wonder if that guy's still alive. Um, <laughs> i got to find that guy. So we thought Yeah, so as I say, the rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated, right? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still around. Uh, so I'm... I'm uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'll be talking a bit about this, this history, what we did, as I say, years ago. Uh, I'm a real old guy, because I graduated from college in 1949. I'm sorry, I, 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 he wants me over here for the camera, so if you don't mind, maybe you want to slide around a little bit. Uh, but in any event, uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting, because as I say, I graduated from college, we didn't have computers when I was in college in the 40s. They didn't, they didn't do that then. Uh, and so basically we had to learn all about them later. And I'll come back to that story a little bit further along here. But it's wonderful to go back and revisit this stuff. And, and frankly, the paper I just mentioned in the annals that, that uh, I wrote about 20, 21 years ago, I went back and read that again after Evan uh, called me uh, for this talk to kind of refresh my memory on all the stuff that happened. And it, it's a fairly long paper, and it goes into a lot of stuff. It goes into the circuits we did, and the logic, and, and quite a bit of the history. And so I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. Now, we got what, about a, about till around 11.30? Yeah, you have your flight to catch. Great, OK. Yeah, I've got to leave at noon anyway. Can you advance the slide to the next one there for me? Great. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about how Silverstein and field data and how this whole thing started with the computers. There was an Army computer program. Then I'll sort of switch gears. I'm kind of starting two parallel tracks. What the Army was doing and then what we did at Sylvania to sort of the kind of the accident of how they came together and it was sort of accidental. Uh, and then I'll go into the Moby Dick computer project and what that was uh, and then how that sort of grew into what's called the field data family. And uh, with a lot of history and an awful lot of stuff. I mean, it really was a, a, an amazing program. Uh, and unfortunately, the results don't end up with a lot, you know, wonderful, happy lived after, ha they happily lived af ever after and stuff because uh, the Vietnam War, the Korean War was kind of over along about that time, but the Vietnam War was cranking up. And that was starting to take the Army swan and they just didn't have any money for what they had to do here, and so they basically cut way back. And so the program, we built some computers, they were deployed, they worked, and it was, a, it was an exciting program. Uh, got a lot of lessons from it, uh, but not a lot of equipment that lasted much longer. Next, please. So right after World War II, Hal Silverstein, and actually I reached Hal Silverstein and talked to him when I wrote the paper. So I found basically almost all the people I'm talking about. I was able to find them 20 years ago, uh, but uh, Evan asked me if, if I knew where they were now, and I have not stayed in touch with any of them. 
And unfortunately, I'm not a squirrel. I don't keep stuff. But I did find some squirrels when I was putting this together. And so I can tell you who some of the squirrels were. And, and they might still have some of this stuff. But I, when I got the material for the paper, uh, just about everybody made me promise to return it, which I did. So I don't have copies of it. But in any event, uh, Hal worked for Lieutenant General O'Donnell, who was chief signal officer. Now, if you've looked up the chief signal officers, what you'll discover is that he's the only one that made it to lieutenant general, which is kind of interesting. He's the only one listed as the lieutenant general in any event. Uh, but he was a very far-sighted gentleman. Uh, and fortunately, Hal Silverstein was as well. And so they, they basically launched a transformation in the way the U.S. Army thought about computers. And that's actually a lot more important how they think about it than what they did in the short term, because they really kind of changed our whole perspective and, and thinking about in, in, in where it ought to be done uh, and uh, focusing on uh, the proving ground and a whole lot of new activities there and new operational concepts. So they basically started a move which is still going on. Next. Uh, there were a lot of different views in those days, uh, there were kind of two views. One, the computers in the Army came out of the ballistic tables and some of the early work that were done then, was done then with the ENIAC. Uh, and on the other side was the whole accounting machine from punch cards and all that history grew up. So there were kind of two different views and they were kind of opposed. And, and frankly, people were beginning to think about the use of computers in the logistics environment as well. Hadn't really thought about them in terms of weapons control and stuff quite as much yet. Uh, but all of that was sort of gradually developing and people were kind of thinking about it. Next slide, please. Uh, Hal Silverstein, I think it was in about 1954 or 55, uh, went to the Western Joint Computer Conference out in, in San Francisco. And while he was there, uh, he went down and met with four captains who were at Stanford University. And uh, he was all excited about computers. He was thinking about putting together awareness courses and all kinds of stuff in the Army. Uh, but when he was out, as I say, out on the West Coast, he talked to these four captains and realized these were, you know, they're bright guys. They were doing graduate work at Stanford. He convinced a couple of them to stay one more semester. And he convinced uh, Captain Lubert to stay a little longer. So three of them, Crawford, Bannister, and Fullerton, all got second master's degrees. Uh, and Bill Lubert stayed on another year and got a PhD. Uh, and this is where they all ended up being, being assigned. But uh, Hal also talked to the uh, dean there at Stanford because they didn't have computer programs. I mean, they had some courses and stuff, but they put together a special program for these captains that basically got all kinds of key people in. And, and I, I talked to some of the names in my paper. There are people that, that were involved in inventing the mouse and a lot of other things that turned out to be leadership ideas in the computer field later. And so they gave lectures to these guys. And so these four got a marvelous exposure to a lot of early creative thinking. And what is, is kind of exciting is they also work together if you're having these debates about what should the Army do with computers. And so out of that period of a semester, a couple of semesters in, in Stanford, a whole lot of ideas spawned. And that's where a lot of this stuff came from, and particularly for Bill Lubert. Uh, next slide, please. So when Bill Lubert returned to Monmouth, or came to Monmouth, and as I say, I, it was uh, my, my recollection was Evans, it was the Signal Laboratory, which I guess was Evans. Is that right, what it, was? it was called the Evans Signal, Signal Lab. It went by several names, Radar Lab, Signal Lab. Yeah. Several okay. Well, I, my problem is, and I'm trying to remember being here, and I know I was down here, but I don't really remember exactly buildings and things like that, so I'm a little vague on that. But in any event, in parallel, when Lubert was still out at Stanford, there were two captains, uh, I'm sorry, young, young lieutenants, rather, here at the lab. 
One was named Herb Brunn, and there was another one whose name I forgot, but it's in my paper. They both graduated from MIT and came down here as Army lieutenants, and they were trying to figure out how to get a computer down here that they could use. And there wasn't any money to buy computers. I mean, computers were then, you either got the thing to do some kind of accounting work or something, or you couldn't get one, and there wasn't any money to buy machines for the purposes that they were generally considered useful for. But there was development funds. There were development funds available. So they decided to put together a spec for a mobile computer to meet some as that then unknown army need. And so they put together a spec. They called it Moby Dick, Mobile Digital Computer. Uh, and that's how the Moby Dick idea grew. And so when Bill Lubert arrived in 56, he <laughs> put the finishing touches on with this group, put the finishing touches on the spec, and they issued it. And it went out to these people. These five companies all were on the bid list. So that's basically where, where things got at that point. And so Lubert was right at the core of getting this started. And as I say, his history out at Stanford with all the discussions they had had and exposure to these leading lights in the computer field, and then coming back and discovering almost accidentally that Herb Brunn and another lieutenant had put together a spec for a computer, and it sort of all kind of fit together. It was amazing. So next slide. So kind of in parallel to this, as I mentioned before, I graduated from college in 1949. I was actually in physics. I wasn't in engineering at all. And I was out in Chicago, and that's where they had the atomic bomb. And I, I actually had met uh, Enrico Fermi. I had a course from him, and, uh, which was kind of, he taught me nuclear physics. Uh, he taught me one other thing, though, which actually has served me stead forever since. He taught me I wasn't cut out to be a nuclear physicist. <laughs> so I decided to move to engineering. Well, the theoretical physics guys, I mean, they were absolutely amazing to be exposed to these guys. I go through this lecture, frame me through this lecture, and some guys were putting together notes, which actually ended up being a published book. And people could actually, I mean, when you listen to Fermi, it was so convincing. And when you went back afterwards to try to reproduce what he did, this sort of step that was obvious from A to B. I mean, some people could figure how to get from A to B, but I never could. And so I was, I, I basically realized, hey, I'm lost in this stuff. Let me go build things, which I really like to do. So I moved into other stuff, and I went into double E and other things. Uh, and I worked in Chicago for a while on their nuclear accelerators. So I was getting my graduate work. Uh, and then I moved to Sylvania in 1953. And uh, actually, while I was there, just shortly after I arrived, I got put in charge of a circuit design group on, I, it was an interesting machine, as a matter of fact. And I don't think I'll have time, but if I do, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about it. It was also for the signal lines, but it was a crypto device. And it was a cryptographic machine uh, to encrypt 48-channel PCM voice. Uh, and this was a 48-channel voice communication link uh, that the NSA wanted to set up between their various offices. And uh, so we were building the machine called the D807, which ran at 1.152 megahertz, then megacycles. Uh, and was encrypting this stuff. And it was a wonderful machine. I, if, as I say, if you get a chance, I'll talk about it a little bit later. But I don't think anybody's heard of it because these things were all highly classified and you couldn't talk about them or anything. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it later if we get a chance. But in any event, so I learned a little bit about that and, and working with this crypto equipment, which was all digital circuits and digital logic, I decided that I really wanted to learn about computers. Uh, the company sent me to a course at MIT that summer of 53, uh, where there's a course taught by a couple of gentlemen from Cambridge on the whirlwind computer. So I learned a little bit about how to, how to write programs and stuff there. Actually, the, the key to that course, though, that's, my wife was the receptionist of the course. So, yeah, 
Out of curiosity, was that court, do you recall whether that course was considered an uh, engineering course or a math course? Which course? The course you were just talking at about. MIT? At MIT? At MIT, yes. I'm not sure. They invited a lot of engineers, so it was probably an engineering probably course. Engineering. It was not a math course. It was not a math course because a lot not... of colleges had math courses back then. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I I was I went to take a, a graduate degree and and uh, I wanted to study computers, and so I talked to Howard Aiken, Howard Aiken at Harvard. I got I knew him, so I went and met him. I met all those guys. It was kind of amazing. I met Jay Forrester and all these other people way back in the early days. So it was a marvelous time to learn about computers. Uh, but in any event, uh, and, and, and Howard Aiken basically sent me, he sent me as a PhD student and he sent me to take theoretical math courses. And it felt just like nuclear physics did. So I said, this, is, <laughs> this ain't for me. Uh, and so for builders, that's not a way. But I figured that I didn't want to do that to build computers. I was doing it. So I went to Northeastern University to see if they had any courses on computers, and they didn't. But they talked me into teaching one. <laughs> so I figured, and I, I learned this from my professor at IIT, where I take in night school, that if you really want to learn to talk about a subject, teach a course in it. And that's true. It really was marvelous. So I actually spent time, evenings, and stuff in laboratories. And by this time, by the way, I, I married the receptionist at this course. And so, it, and, and, and that's neat. What is it now? 54 years. and seven children and 11 grandchildren later, I think it'll last. So <laughs> in any event, um, so I, I agreed to teach a course on computer design called Switching Circuits and Computer Design or something like that. Uh, and I read everything published on computers at the MIT and Harvard li libraries. And it couldn't, it was one book and about, you know, a couple of dozen papers. There wasn't a whole lot written. And so it wasn't very hard to get caught up with what was going on. And so teaching a course, having to read all that stuff, and I had people signed up who were working for Datamatic, building computers and designing stuff. So I, fortunately, there were a bunch of people that were actually working on computers that came to my course. And so I did, as I say, I learned more in teaching that first year. I taught it for four years, but in te teaching it the first year was the more, most marvelous course I think I've ever taken or given. It was. Very, very uh, useful. And so I learned a lot about computer design by teaching it. So that's what we did. And that started right about this same time. Uh, and we got, uh, in 56, I was now running the department, was doing all this work. The D807 had gone. We had some small stuff for the Air Force and a couple little special purpose computers and other stuff we had developed. But all that work was wrapping up. And so I had this department with a bunch of good engineers. I guess we had a couple of dozen engineers at that point. And uh, so we heard about two RFPs. One was the Moby Dick RFP, and the other was from the Naval Training Devices Center, was a digital computer uh, to do flight simulations on fighter aircraft. And they, they, were, they wanted to build a digital computer for that. No one had used a digital computer to simulate aircraft, you know, in-flight simulation to get in and practice flying with it. Uh, and so in any event, so we, those two RFPs were coming out. We weren't on the RFP list for either of them. So I called on both of them with our, our marketing folks. We only had two weeks to get both bids in, but we decided to do it anyway. And so we did. We submitted both bids. Next slide. It turned out, in parallel, have you ever heard of the BEMUSE system? The Ballistic Missile Early Warning System across the northern slopes of Alaska and, and Canada was to provide early warning to the U.S. and Canada, more, mostly the U.S., a little warning to Canada, but early warning of incoming aircraft attacks. This is pre-ballistic missile. Uh, but they wanted to put this thing together to provide early warning of attacks, and they needed to get the system put in place, and so they put out the contract, and Sylvania won the contract. So this was the other part, the big radar part of what we had. They were doing all kinds of stuff in, in aircraft and other things. So Sylvania won the contract, and they needed a lot of engineers, so the decision was that they were going to disband my group, move us all into the Bemuse program. 
which wasn't very happy idea as far as I was concerned. Next slide. Uh, so we convinced them. Next slide. Move, move it ahead one. Yeah. So we, as I say, we made the proposal deadline. We just got the UDOF and Moby Dick bids in. Next slide. And I agree. They, the management finally, after much debate, they finally agreed we had to wait so we got the response to these two bids. Otherwise, you know, we, we'd have these bids and nobody to, to implement them. Next. And it turned out only RCA and Slovenia submitted bids for Moby Dick. Next. And we won. So we won the Moby Dick contract and move on. We also won the UDOF contract. So we won both of them. <laughs> so here we were a little 20 person group and all of a sudden we had two large scale general purpose computers to develop. <laughs> which was, I would say, a bit of a challenge. Well, fortunately, I was able to hire a bunch of guys out of my course. <coughs> so I had a bunch of people that I'd been training on how to design computers, and they came. And uh, a little bit later, we also hired Herb Brunn when he uh, got out of the Army. So he was down here at the Signal Labs, and he joined us. So he'd been putting together the spec, and he came and helped. And so we hired a bunch of people and some very good very good engineers. And so we put that together, and that's how the Moby Dick effort started. Uh, incidentally, by the way, on the UDOF, just for your information, this was done to the specs of the University of Pennsylvania, their computer operation there, had put in these specs for the Naval Training Devices Center on how you would build a digital computer to simulate aircraft. And so when we won the contract, we had some GFE equipment which they installed in our lab. And the GFE equipment was a big F-104 analog simulator. They actually fly the thing. And we, our, our job was to build a computer and then pull the analog stuff off and plug it into our computer. And that's basically what we had to do. But I, I, I got to fly the, I'd, I'd been a pilot in the Navy briefly, or training to be a pilot, and so the, they let me fly the simulator, the F-104. I'd never flown an F-104 in real life, and so this is really exciting. But it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, next slide. So anyway, uh, as I say, we won the contract. But all down the road, as the Army started to grow the program, and as you'll see here, as other things began to pop up and the field data program started to develop and that sort of thing, it grew into a $30 million piece of work for Sylvania. And there's a lot of other stuff going on. I'll tell you, all of a sudden, there were an awful lot of people that were very interested in bidding on the field data program. And Moby Dick started off as a $1.6 million contract. Actually, it's kind of a funny story on that, because I know uh, one day Bill Lubert came to me after we'd been working on it for, I don't think very long, three, four months. And he said, we, uh, they had a delayed delivery three months. And he said, that's no problem, is it? And I said, well, I don't know. We better take a look. It, it, it could be. And he was kind of surprised that we would charge him to delay. It was a cost plus contract. So, uh, <coughs> in any event, the next day we talked, and we'd gone over it. And I said, look, the problem is we're already staffed up. I was able to get people on the job. We put most of people on that right away. We were hiring people to go into the other, moving around. But I had staff already. And I said, so I, I, if we got the same staff and keep them on three months longer, that'll cost you more money. So they agreed. And everybody finally said, oh, I guess that's right. So they gave us some added funding. And three, four, or five months later, he came back and said, we got the funding for Fort Huachuca. We can start testing on the original schedule. So let's put it back to the original schedule. OK. And so if you can give us back the money then, right? I said, well, I don't know. Let me take a look. <laughs> so we did. And I came back the next day. And I told them, I said, I'm afraid to put it back on the original schedule will cost more money. <laughs> and he couldn't believe it. Well, what had happened was we worked with Herb Brun, who was still at the labs, and others. And a whole lot of ideas had come up about things we ought to do in terms of some offline controls and real-time interaction, all kinds of stuff that they wanted added to the machine. 
and we already put it in the design and we're starting to build it that way. And so to accelerate, we have to take that out, which would have cost money. We need added people. So I convinced them that we actually needed more money to accelerate it. And so I tell that story periodically that there really is no such thing as a free change in this business. And it was true. But so we got by with it. But I must admit the accountants had an awful time <laughs> with that. The bill managed to get it through. So in any event, that's where we started. $1.6 million contract. But it did, as I say, grow because an awful lot of new stuff people kept thinking up that needed to get done. We did actually do our work within the committed cost, however, which was unusual in those days. Next, please. Uh, and this is what a Moby Dick was going to look like. This is a standard army trailer with the racks, the, t the, the, the tapes. These turned out to be Ampex tapes, and they were the most troublesome part of the whole system. But uh, in any event, that's, that's what, it, what it looked like. Next slide. Those are backing column tapes? Pardon? Backing column tapes? I think so. I'm not sure exactly. They were very early Ampex tapes. I, I really don't remember what they were. I, I should tell you, I left Sylvania and went to IBM before we had the final, the first machines installed. We finished the, de the development. We're building the machine. But I had, in fact, left. I'll come back to that story a little bit later. And Next slide. My question yeah. is, I think I'm going to be asking this before, but I'd like to know who had the idea and how it came about to make it mobile instead of make it just that they just let it do. The two engineers, Herb Brunn and this other engineer who I describe in the paper, I <laughs> believe were the ones that came up with the name Moby Dick and everything else. And the whole original idea was to be able to get a computer, to use, use development money to get a computer. They did. I don't think they had a real concept for how it would ever be used. And I think that's where Lou Burton Because the, there was a computer of years before called Diceac. Yeah. It was also in a trailer, but I'm told that it was taken out for testing in somewhere in the desert and never once you got in the desert, the sand got in and it never really worked. Yeah. Yeah. So, but they were driving around. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is what the machine <coughs> looked like. Thirty eight bit word length, four thousand Words of memory, that's amazing when you think about that, uh, what we have today. And it could grow, it could be expanded. So we could actually grow up uh, to uh, multiple core memories and, and uh, up to a lot of magnetic tapes. We actually had controllers for I.O. and that sort of thing. Uh, and we had connect teletype and paper tape reader, all kinds of stuff. So it was. It was quite a machine. It was a fairly full range of stuff, a bunch of index registers, real-time registers, and it was the speed range. And I'll show you some of the comparisons a little bit later. So basically, we had a, an eight microsecond memory cycle, and, and the instructions, the basic instructions, took two cycles. Next slide. And this is the overall memory structure. We basically had, this was, this was essentially the, the, the basic computer itself. We had memory units, which you could connect off a main transfer bus. And, and we had memory address units here, and a program counter address registers and various index registers and the like. And so that's where the, 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 the machine basically ran. We had an instruction register and a decoder, uh, an arithmetic unit. And then we had various I.O. units. They were in-out in -out converters. Uh, and those then connected to the control units for the various devices. And, and what was interesting about it, these were, you could connect multiples of them. So we could get up to four I.O. converters, and they could be running in parallel. So you can see the, the converters, and the converters connected to all the controllers. So you'd have a, essentially a, a, an I.O. bus and a main bus. And so it was pretty reliable units. You could actually have a converter fail, and you could access the same control units through other converters. It was kind of unique, and we got patents on a bunch of this stuff. I left, I left having copies of our, of our patents. So I got a bunch of patents on this thing. Uh, and then the real-time address registers. And we could uh, almost unlimited number of the real-time registers. And those basically did allow you to work in and out of the memory of the other machine. So you could keep two machines in synchronous. Two complete Moby Dick units could run together. They could maintain sync. Uh, and they were designed to do that. Do you know how they were built? Uh, 
How many more convictions were built? Oh, I'll come to that. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a lot, but we did build a number of them. Okay, next. Are there any still around that we park outside the museum? Pardon? Are there any still around that we park outside? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't believe it. Uh, I believe the Moby Dick B may be around. There may be one of them around. The because uh, I know it was originally sent to one of the labs. I described described where some of these machines went in the paper. Uh, so I don't know. I'd be surprised if they were junk. So they must be somewhere. Two ended up in Germany. I know. So these are the standard words. I won't go into those. Next. Actually. Yeah. Um, I saw. The, these uh, six characters in 36 want to go bits. Back, go back one. So you were, you were doing a uh, six-bit character representation, not ASCII? This was pre-ASCII. So pre-ASCII. Okay. Pre so it was your own encoding? We had the field data code, which was designed with, with the signal lab as to what a standard code would be. So we put together the field data code, and the team that did the field data code actually ended up working on the ASCII committee to come up with the ASCII code. Yes? Uh, BCBIC was purely IBM. Where did that fit in along with it? I'm sorry, I said this? Would this be BCBI, but binary coding desk and limit change code? Remember the IBM was EBCDIC, but there was a previous one, BCBIC. I never got involved in that. That was before okay. my time, I think, at IBM. No, relation to that. no, there was no connection at all. Okay. No, no. Uh, actually, the the, the issue we struggled with here was actually an issue, I think, that was going on here at Monmouth. Because it was a big issue of how do these codes relate to teletype? Because the, the Signal Corps was basically a teletype organization, and so we had to be compatible with teletype. That was BOTA, right? Right, BOTA. Yeah. BOTA, B-O-D-O-T? B-A-U-D-S. Is that what you mean? What are you talking about? The encoding that the old teletypes used before ASCII. Oh, the name of it. Yeah. The name of the code, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Uh, but we had to stick with the, with the teletype <laughs> character sets, and it had to be compatible with that and everything. Uh, and Lubert was actually personally on the, the ASCII committee when that was formed, and he basically made the decision to not use field data as a base for ASCII. Because his view was that being connected and essentially force fit to teletype, the teletype was going to be disappeared. And it just as well he did. I mean, if we kept ASCII hung to teletype, it probably wouldn't have been able to be that useful. So this was tied to teletype, and so it did basically uh, lead to its uh, demise. Uh, but it was very useful. I mean, it was going through all the issues of what do you need and how do you use control characters and which they are and all of that stuff. Got the whole character set listed there and, and where we had standard characters and extras and the parody and how we used all this stuff. It was all in that. Uh, and I think it was a marvelous education, even though the code itself did not survive. Next. Uh, and this is the I.O. structure. I think I talked about you connect the I.O. controller to the main transfer bus and then to the down here to the controllers. And so this is how it worked. And this is the control here in various control units and counters. So the, the, basically these converter units were essentially little parallel computers. And you could run stuff through them and they'd, they'd control all the devices and the, 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 the data flow in back into the memories. Uh, and uh, so they could operate and they could pump the, the I.O. data through the real-time registers to other computers as well. So it was really kind of a powerful system. And that was part of the stuff we got when I said talk about this three-month delay and what, what we put into that. All of that of how you do some of this stuff was part of what we put in. So that three-month delay turned out to really help add a lot to the logic. Prior to that, it was a very simple structure. Next slide. And this was the real-time logic. You can see we had the various real-time buses and, 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 and bit counters and controls and central control. And so we'd go down transmitter receiver here, terminal equipment. Uh, and so the I.O. registers, real-time registers, you could use this to connect directly through to another computer. And so you plug in that way. And uh, I don't remember if they ever did it over communication lines. 
I don't think so. I think it was all local connection. But I don't know of any case where it was actually run, which is, we did testing of it, but I don't know if it was ever actually run. Next slide. We used all transistor logic, and this was something. The guy we hired to do the design, I think came out of Lincoln Lab. He was a PhD, uh, Ed Kohler was his name, marvelous guy. Uh, and he, uh, he had a wonderful background, and he ran the little circuit group to design the transistor circuit. As a matter of fact, I, he, he was so good, and I, he, I was so, so relied on him. I had patents on old vacuum tube circuits and stuff, but I never got into transistor circuit design because he was handling all of that stuff. So I was always kind of, I, I could never walk through that much stuff. So I never actually built any transistor circuits. I, I, was, I was an old vacuum tube guy. But he did a marvelous job. And as I say, he designed the circuits to operate from minus 30 to plus 65 centigrade. I mean, that was incredible. Uh, they designed them and derated them so that they could work with a beta de deterioration of 50%, which was extraordinary, and the power variations and that sort of thing. What was interesting was the circuits were so well designed. I mean, we never had any failures. I'll show you data on that later. The circuits just didn't fail. Uh, but they later cranked the speed of the computer up to two megahertz. They doubled the speed of the machine. Just turn up the volume. I mean, <laughs> we actually designed the logic, by the way, for the machine so you could run it in single step mode. So the whole logic of the computer, you could run it one step at a time. And uh, from my old experience working with a crypto machine, I had discovered that you had to be able to do that to find some problem. If you couldn't do that, you couldn't run it a step at a time, you'd never figure things out. And so we designed it to do that, and that allowed us to run it essentially any speed. So it was very good. Yeah? The, the reference to the question, um, the reference to the temperature, um, the mobile unit, was it simply filtered forced air cooled? Was there a liquid cooling system? Was there an air conditioning system? Yeah, there was, there was a conditioning system. I don't remember what it was. Okay. No, I do not remember the details on it, but uh, I'm sure it was, if for, if for no other reason. I mean, it generated a lot it of heat. It would cook otherwise. Oh, yeah, it generated a lot I of heat. I think I read about that in the paper, in the 87 paper. Was it in there? I think so. Yeah. Well, the problem was you, you had to have people in it. Yes. And the people can't work in that range. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, transistors can, but not people. Uh, and I should say, going back to the D807 I mentioned, when we built that unit, and that had to withstand similar variations, but it didn't go to, it did go to minus 30, but it went to 132 Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in C, but that 132 Fahrenheit is <coughs> hot, but it also had to withstand 95% humidity with temperature cycling, which means you could get snow in the, in the chamber, and we did. And I remember we actually took the machine and we ran it there. And I remember you going in and out of a chamber at 132 degrees is not fun. So I don't, I don't recommend it to anybody. We had all that physical before they let us go. But in any event, uh, so we've been through an awful lot of that stuff before with the 807. Um, so that's what we had here. And the circuits were amazing. Next slide. Show you some of them in a minute. Uh, the real question we had, the question result was reliability. And the question, the concern was, how could we actually maximize the reliability or minimize failure rates on these things? And the conclusion that Ed Kohler came to was that the failure rate was due to the number of semiconductor elements, not the number of transistors. And so he, we had to count diodes and transistors, and the cores were an unknown. Had a little bit more logic understanding there, but the, 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 we were a little concerned here, and the speed of the core transistor logic was not proven, so that was marginal. Uh, but in any event, so the pure transistor logic turned out to have by far the lowest number of semiconductors when you add these up, and it had the, by far the best speed rating. So they concluded that we would, in fact, use all transistor logic, which we did. And, and so that was what, the, what it was like. Yes. And there were just some of the simple circuits, simple inverter, next, emitter follower, next. This is what our flip-flop was. Uh, 
and we had a bus driver. This was this was key. We had all these big buses to drive, so that was a critical one, multiple load, as you can see with the meter followers and stuff here. Uh, next, and so we had just the basic logic converters and ands and ors, and I think that's about it. So if if you want, why well, does anybody want to talk about circuits? I can't say much about them. You probably know about them than I do, but. If you want to talk about that, we, we, we can go back to that. But let me let me step ahead here. How are we doing on time? No, we are moving ahead. So, uh, so we designed it, and uh, the Signal Corps then had lots more ideas for what they wanted. Uh, and Moby Dick was to be the largest in the family, but they wanted to run, have some smaller systems as well. Uh, and they were all supposed to use the common field data code, which we had developed. Uh, we actually developed that in our in our lab in in uh, Waltham and later in Needham. Uh, and the guy who developed it was a fellow named I remember his name was Bosch. Uh, I, I I I I got his name I think in the paper, but or he's on he's on one of the patents anyway that I that I gave you. Uh, but he was the guy who basically worked that out, talking to the Signal Corps guys and going through all of the mechanics and designing a a code, a code family like that was a non-trivial job because he had to worry about all the compatibility issues and everything else. But he came up with that. It was a very nice job. And that's the one we all standardized on and used. Next. As I say, the, the <coughs> Moby Dick had a possible set of 64 instructions. We used 54 of them. We had 10 spares. Uh, and the idea was to use them for very special purposes. And of course, the, the problem you run into on every one of these is compatibility. Uh, they wanted a smaller machine, the Moby Dick B. And it was to be a much smaller machine. And the problem was with Moby Dick B uh, that there wasn't enough room to have all the logic for all the instructions we had in the family. We only have 39 directly implemented instructions, so we had to try to minimize the, the whole logic. And so what we did was we came up with what we call subroutined instructions. And this, at the time, this was the first time I knew of anybody doing anything that later got called microcode. So we built what we thought was the first microcoded machine. And uh, we got a patent on it. It's one of the patents that you've got. Uh, and I don't know of anyone who ever, Sylvania never pursued the patents. So they never enforced them. I think they could have made a bundle, bundle of money about, out of that. But I'm not sure. And the reason I'm not sure is that it turns out that Wilkes, who was one of the guys who taught this computer course at, at MIT that I took, Wilkes from Cambridge, when he came over, it turns out the very early Atlas machine that he'd built had concepts like that in it as well. So although he hadn't described it, uh, we were in fact not the first. And this is something I'm sure that you, a lot of people were aware of, and that is ideas pop up in about three or four places simultaneously and you struggle to see who did it first. But I think Wilkes was ahead of us. Uh, in any event, so it was essentially a microcoded machine. Uh, and this was before IBM had this whole family of compatible systems. So this was a family of compatible computers that would run the same programs on the Moby Dick B as well as on the regular Moby Dick. Uh, and that was true for the whole family, to run the same programs across the family of machines and to have, the, as I say, this common language, intercommunication. It was really a first. It was a family of computers, which is kind of amazing. And it came out of Lubert and that whole crew right here in these labs. And so this was the basic pack, which was with the Moby Dick B. As you can see, it's a lot smaller than what we had before. Just to mount a truck. Uh, next. And this is what the whole field data family looked like. So we had here general purpose computers, the Moby Dick, which we did, the basic pack computer. We delivered that in, in as I say, December 59. I joined IBM in July 59, so I was not there at the initial delivery. But we did make the contract. We did make the, the committed date. Philco delivered the basic pack a couple of years later, about a little over a year later. IBM developed the informer, and unfortunately it was never delivered, never finished. Uh, they decided to try some fancy magnetic logic that 
nobody had used before, and it didn't work. Uh, and so that was the problem they ran into. And there are a whole bunch of things that went with this. You can see the field data, there's communication equipment, some I.O. gear, uh, typewriters, and stuff like that. These were all troublesome, pretty much every one of them. Uh, but the magnetic tape was, was really a problem. I, I talked to people later who used the machines in the field, and they were, the tapes were a real problem. Next slide. The performance was quite impressive. You can see IBM 705 and 709. As you can see, our, our memory access rates were faster. I.O. rates were, were very impressive. They were close to the 705, way better than the 709. Uh, and uh, you can see the price was a lot more attractive. So it was, it was a pretty nice machine. Yeah. These are all contemporary, pretty much. They were all at the same time. When was the 704? Um, the 704 had been a couple of years earlier. Uh, the 709 was uh, update replacement of, I believe the 704 was in 54. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that was actually the, that came after I took my course at MIT, which was 53. But the 704 was sort of the first of those machines that got generally used. And it was a, quote, scientific machine. Uh, and that's another interesting point. The Moby Deck was really designed to handle scientific and business applications. Whereas the 705 and, uh, and, and uh, later 7070 and other IBM machines were designed for the commercial business side and the 704, 709, 790s, and others were all designed for the scientific side. <clears throat> and the later IBM 360 then put the two together to be able to process both kinds of transactions and rapid, more rapid I.O. and all of that. And that's exactly what field data did. But it did it, as I say, in 1959 instead of 1966. So it was way ahead of its time. Uh, it was the first large-scale transistorized computer. All the others were vacuum tubes. It was a transistorized machine. Uh, and IBM, uh, Sylvania, tried to introduce it as the 9400. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Next. A quick question on that. Yeah. Those data rates are based on the 1 megahertz clock or the 2 megahertz clock? These are all based on the 1. So it was, if you crank it, it could go even better. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't affect the I.O. rates, but it would certainly affect the, the uh, arithmetic speed. The data and arithmetic rates. Oh, yeah. So these rates would go way up. Yeah. Because we actually doubled the memory speed, too. So it was, it was really cranked up. It was, it was very effective. And so these were the counts. Pretty good-sized machines. The I.O. converters, as you can see, had a lot of logic in them. There's a lot of speed. Yeah. So they were non-trivial machines. Uh, and the memories, offline control unit. That's what the OCLU was. And this, the idea of that, this was, again, one of the contract extensions that we got. The idea of that was to be able to do a lot of tape processing and sorting and, and, and I.O. and all of that without tying up the main computer. And so you could just basically lift the tape off the Moby Deck, put it on the OCLU. You could run out printing from it. You could do sorting, <coughs> do all kinds of stuff. And so the offline control unit was really a, as I say, with only 7,000 uh, uh, transistors, it wasn't a real big machine. But it did have the basic logic to do simple stuff like sorting and printing and stuff like that. And it was, it was great. And so it was very economical. It saved you know, a lot of the commercial applications, it would save you having a, a bunch of uh, computers that would just do sorting. <coughs> so it was really a very attractive way to do it. Next. Uh, and this is some of the reliability experience from it. You can see hours of operation. Uh, I think I'll talk about where, where they were used, I believe, in a minute. Um, but the deep data processing stuff didn't work. I mean, it didn't, didn't fail here, the CPU. Essentially, it, they did not fail. The I.O. converters didn't fail. It was just very good logic that, that had put together. I don't know what the CPU failure was on this one. It looks like they had a couple here. Uh, 
memories. But, you know, that, that's a pretty fair amount of operation uh, between failures. Even the whole system was running like a year before between failures, which wasn't too bad in those days. Uh, and so it was really pretty pretty high rate. Next. Yeah. Yeah, this is fascinating. We designed it. I mean, it had to be with, you know, it stand shock and vibration and all the temperature and everything else. And so it was in this truck and we put it through the proving grounds and the trucks failed. <laughs> the computer worked fine. The trucks failed. So uh, as I say, it was, that was great. <laughs> we were pleased with that. As I say, having done it before with the old D807 machine that I mentioned, that was a marvelous experience. I mean, that was really a background that was extremely helpful. So trying to do this the first time you ever build a machine, I think would be very difficult. Uh, and, and of course, the issue you run into with things like tapes and all that kind of stuff, it's very hard to ruggedize those guys. Okay, next. Yeah, and this is the packaging <coughs> that looked like the console. The earlier picture showed the console at the, at the end. But I believe this is the way it ended up being built. Uh, as I say, I wasn't there when we delivered the final year. Air conditioner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where's the air conditioner? Down the front or on the left. Yeah. Air right conditioner right here. Yeah. It's not right next to the console, but <laughs> who knows? You open the door. Uh, yeah. But it did have to have an air conditioner, but I've forgotten what kind it was. It was more than just circulating air. Though. Next. Yeah, so we delivered the one Moby Dick A to, to Monmouth, where it was tested and used. C is the one that went to uh, Fort Huachuca and then the 7th Army. Uh, one of the guys, uh, one of the managers at, at, uh, at Sylvania actually went with it and set up the installation, got it all going there. Uh, <laughs> So you can see they sent uh, three of them went went to Europe. Army security and, and right back Germany for stock control. And I don't know what this one did with the Seventh Army, but it was logistics pretty much. There was a lot of spare parts management, all kinds of stuff. So they were in fact in production and in use. And three of them in Europe. Uh, Moby Dick one was built. Uh, and went to Tactical Operations Center at Fort Leavenworth. It may still be there. You could try and see what's, where it is. Might be there, be in a truck. But it was never used. I wouldn't be surprised it might even still work. But you never know. Uh, next. So as I say, it, it really did a lot of early stuff. It was exciting. The, the, the basic pack had a disk file, one of the very first disk, big disk memories. Field data code was a precursor to ASCII. The whole idea of compatible machine architectures and, and uh, compatible systems. The, the uh, idea of you know, uh, scientific and business and this applications in the same systems. Real-time implementation, connection, all that. Lots of stuff. It was, uh, and, and one of the things that I didn't really describe here, uh, and it came up later, I was program manager at IBM for the air traffic control network that we bid for the FAA, which was in 1964, I believe. Yeah, we bid it in 65, actually. Uh, and that was exciting at the time. It was IBM's biggest contract. Uh, and it was to build the, you know, the nationwide en route air traffic control network. Uh, and we won the, we won the bid. Was that uh, the uh, Sabre system? Pardon? Was that the Sabre system? Oh, no, no. Sabre was, was uh, that was for American Airlines. Oh, okay. That was the reservation system. All right. No, this is the en route air traffic control network that is set up in Atlantic City. And it runs today, the network we fly. In. And that same computer system is still flying today, which is what makes me more nervous than anything else. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's an oldie. But the, 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 before I go to that, the reason that that's an issue was when I got to IBM, and this is after a number of years, 
uh, there was a big fight between the marketing people and the development people as to whether you could build a computer system that had this kind of polymorphic architecture. That means part, one part could fail and the rest could keep working and that sort of thing, multiple systems working together. Uh, and I argued that you could do it. So I was disagreeing with the engineering folks where I was an engineer and supporting the marketing guys. And that was not, the, the, the engineering community didn't like that too much, but in any event, so I ended up being put in charge of the bid. And the reason that I argued for it was because we'd done it with Moby Dick. So I knew you could do it. The engineers were arguing you couldn't do it. And my argument was that I knew we did because the Moby Dick people had done it almost 10 years before. And so that just gives you an idea how far ahead this was. And that's the way the current air traffic control network in the nation is run. And it comes from that logic. So there's a, there's a lot of history back behind that, which is kind of fun. So that's where we are. Uh, next. Yeah. So I, it, was, it was a marvelous experience. It was great fun. Let me switch to the next one. Leave the next one on here while I, while I talk. These are some of the people I talked to. This is the paper I mentioned. Hal Servostein was a big help. She's, she's the, 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 the best squirrel I know. I mean, she's, she saved everything. So I got, when I got hold of Gene, and I, I think she may still be around, when I got hold of Gene, uh, she had all kinds of, she had me crates of stuff. So I got all kinds of stuff, uh, old manuals, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I, she must have a basement that's uh, jammed. One, one gal on the whole project? Uh, she was the programmer. I think she's, oh no, there were, there were uh, I don't think we had any, any women engineers at the time. I don't believe, I don't remember any, no, not in the group. We didn't discriminate against them, they but we didn't have any, no, no. Uh, but uh, <coughs> she, she was great. She later joined IBM. She's got all kinds of awards. She's really, we had some amazingly capable people. So that was that. Bernie Galler is at Michigan. He's the guy that got hold of me to write the article for the annals. He's, he was a professor there. I, I was involved with him at IBM. Uh, earlier than this. Well, if I got a minute, no, I'm out of time. Yeah. Can you send the article to the now? Uh, you can get it, uh, <coughs> but if you, when you go to get it, I think you got to pay something to, to you need it out. archives access to get it. Yeah, but you can go in, I think you can go in <coughs> and access it. I think it will, they will actually send you a PDF if you pay them 19 bucks or something. Some Somewhere. of the university libraries have access to that as right. well. So yeah. if you have a the university office, account. Yeah. yeah, you may want to take, you got the you got the talk here. If people want copies of it, maybe ask okay. Evan. Well, I was going to say two things, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, first of all, I mean, you know, InfoAge just started building InfoAge as a museum in the early 2000s. And our computer club, Mark, didn't get involved until 2005, early in the year. And when we got here, and for, up until very, very recently, until six months ago, Whenever the people who run InfoAge talk about the other groups outside of InfoAge, they talk about the radar history, the radio history, the signal war history, and they never mention computers. Yeah. And that bothers me. So I can try to get them to get the manager of InfoAge to appreciate what happened here. Yeah. And this is your talk they go a long way toward that. Yeah. Because our CEO of the museum is a former colonel. Yeah. So he'll this he'll, he'll, he'll understand Army terms. Yeah. Also, even if the IEEE access was open to the public, a lot of people don't want to or can't sit there and read a long paper. Yeah. We could take this and put it on YouTube. Yeah. So let me, let me take a yeah. minute and tell the D807 story, Please. which is kind of a funny one. When I joined IB, uh, as Sylvania, when I joined Sylvania in 1953, I'd been trained as a physicist and stuff, but I was put in charge of a group designing circuits, which was kind of interesting. I didn't know about circuit design, but again, I followed the same thesis I did in learning about computers. They had them teach me what they were doing, so I didn't have to tell them how to do it. But So it was a very good group, and we started building this machine, uh, and they got all the circuits working, and I became the logic expert on this thing, and so I was studying this crypto machine. What we were doing, this was to take a 48-channel voice communication system. It was a PCM voice <coughs> communication network that had been built. And I don't know who built it. It was AT&T or somebody, but it was built for the Signal Corps. 
Um, and we actually had a, a unit installed later, not, a, not immediately, but we were going to get a unit of GFE. And our job was to take that and encrypt it and then decrypt it. And we were given by the Signal Corps, actually by, the, by NSA, sort of through the Signal Corps, the logic for doing that. And I don't know, it must have been very closely held because I don't think anybody got to see anything. It was, it was uh, very confidential stuff. But in any event, when we started to build this thing, we could get the circuits working, but the logic was random logic. And there was no way to tell if it was working or not. I mean, you take, we were using, by the way, the early Tektronix scopes, the, the, the 52 vintage uh, scopes there, the 50 vintage, I guess, is the one that looks most familiar. Uh, so those are the scopes we're using those days. And you put that on this thing, and all you see is, is fuzz. I mean, you, you can see the circuit work, but you couldn't see what the logic was doing. Uh, and so I spent days and nights struggling over this crazy logic. And it finally occurred to me that if I took the output of the encrypt unit and connected it to the input, because we're supposed to encrypt and decrypt. If I connected the input and the output, and I set the switches the right way, I could get a digital standing wave. It was amazing. So you get this thing to synchronize, and all of a sudden the pattern was, I could predict what the pattern ought to be if the logic worked. And so we took the first breadboard unit, which we had built up, and I figured this thing out over a weekend, and I came in and set up the switches that way and connected it up, and bam, it popped in. I'll t that's the most rewarding experience I have ever had. It was extraordinary. <coughs> We worked out about a dozen patterns, and so I'd switch it, and it would swap into another one. It was great. And so the signal core came up about a month later, and we had the first unit up there, and we to demonstrate how it worked. And they came up with uh, three guys in, in dark suits uh, who joined along. They didn't really, they introduced them, but didn't tell you too much about what they did. So I figured they were probably from NSA. But in any event, these guys sat down in a little conference room, and so we went through this story and explained the whole thing, how we were testing this thing and what this looked like and everything. So I took them in the lab and set it up, and you can see all this fuzz there, and I threw the switches just right, and the pattern popped in, and the signal core guys were all excited, and the three guys in dark suit didn't say a thing. And I realized later, even though we delivered the machines, we delivered all of them on schedule. They work like a charm. And I learned later that they were run on a link between uh, a couple of NSA offices for 5,000 hours and without a failure. I mean, you just leave them alone. They would run in the basement, you turn them on, leave them. They have 5,000 vacuum tubes. This is non-trivial. And they had to withstand the same shock and temperature and everything else. So they were really rugged systems. Uh, but the minute the NSA guys saw that, that you could set up standing patterns with this, that's the last thing they wanted in the crypto system. So I, I think my clever demonstration killed the machine. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a successful failure, let me put it that way. But anyway, so we're that, that's the story. And, and any more questions? I think we've, we've used all the time there is. Yes? Guy, you mentioned something about disk systems. About what? About disks as part of the uh, system. Yes, there was a disk, a Bryant disk. Bryant, uh, I don't know whether they still exist or not. Can you describe that a bit? What role it played? It was a disk drive. It was a disk memory. It was supposed to be a mass memory, large scale. I have no re recollection of how big it was. Uh, I mentioned it there. I don't think I talk about the size of the paper. Was it a fixed head disk or both? Or a movie they were fixed. Okay. They were fixed. Uh, it was like a drum, right. but it was multiple. Uh, I beg your pardon, no, it wasn't. We had, uh, it was uh, multiple disks, but they were, they were, had fixed with a, with a head on each track. I think that's what it was. And okay. they did, they did scan in and out. Uh, and it was supposed to be a large scale. Now, a large scale in those days is quite different than it is today. So I have no idea how big it was. Did you use it for register storage or strictly for? Uh, oh, it was, it was not online for the system. No, it, it was used uh, as a large scale memory. That was how it was designed oh, by the Army. Offline storage. Offline storage. Oh, so yeah. they were removable cracks. Then. No, no, no. It was oh. a big unit. It was in a, in a system. What do I call it? Was, there were two of them. Uh, I think the basic pack used it, and the informer was supposed to use it. 
They're supposed to be used for intelligence data processing and stuff like that. So it'd be large scale data they would put in it. But it was, they wanted something that they could use that would be more efficient for a lot of the stuff they wanted to do, more efficient than using tape. Okay. Yeah, that was the original idea. I, it, as far as I know, it never got into, into widespread use, but it was a very early disk and it did work. <coughs> Yes. It was an integral part of the system, then? No, no, it was it was part of one of the machines. The basic Moby Deck did not have it. The basic Moby Deck had the the tapes, the paper punch, teletypes, that stuff. It did not have the disk. Yes. Question question here first. Yeah. When did the vacuum tubes finally go away in the history of this the large scale computers? And a sage like that. Sage was yeah, yeah. Sage, Whirlwind, those were all vacuum tube machines. Okay. Moby Dick in '56 was the first big transistorized machine, as far as I know. I've heard they're still confined to this, maybe more of the radar component of the FA aircraft control system. heard there are still vacuum tube technologies in that. Yeah, I think a lot of that's connected with the displays and stuff. There's no logic, no computer logic. What? Matter of fact, transistors aren't used anymore, it's all semiconductors. So, just, uh, there's a gentleman back here first. Just minute. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess you developed on that delay period when you had that delay. The three months, you yeah. Software then, right? You developed the basically you developed a control program for the system, right? Because I was thinking early. I don't know if in IBM uh, before the 360 whether they called their control software or their system software operating system. I think before that they were just called control programs. I was wondering how extensive that was. That uh, we was. no the, the the three months delay we used for logic design. There was no the, the only programming we did uh, was done by Jean Samet and I think a couple of people who worked with her. Right. Uh, and it was only a simple assembler program, some very basic utilities. We didn't have operating systems in those right. days. I guess what she did would fit into the uh, control processes, right? Yeah. Fundamentally, what they did was they had a simple job control procedure where right. you basically you dump in one job at a time and it would go. And something to tell you this file is on this disk out here. Yeah, simple stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I wrote my programs at Whirlwind very early on, that was the first time we basically used symbolic assemblers. We, we did not have to write in absolute memory addresses. Up to that time, people had written in absolute memory. So when you wrote instructions in a computer, and, and when we did there, then we were actually punched them out on teletype. The memory was wired, uh, the, 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 the memory story. It didn't have tapes then, it was wire, wire memory in those early days. And they had just moved from the old Williams tubes, which were essentially, they, they stored on a, on a memory raster on a screen. And that's what they did, a CRT memory store. They had just moved to the uh, uh, magnetic core memories when I got there. And my wife worked at the lab. And so we had an old Williams memory tube at home that they cut off and we used it as a cookie jar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you could decide at one time what disk was going to be used for, or what tape was going to be used for what file? Oh, yeah. So you could switch that. The right program way. would actually call on the control unit. Yeah, okay. And it would call on the particular device. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so that's what, so we had, there was an I.O. unit address <coughs> in the memory structure, if you saw the I.O. memory structure. So you could actually address it in the program and it would go through all the controllers and stuff and out to the converters and controllers out to the device. Uh, and if one controller was busy, it would go through the other one. So you could switch that. Yeah. Well, it would, though the logic would switch it. you just call on it, would you get one. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, it would automatically yeah. do that. If one was out, you'd use another one. Yeah, there was another question. You have two more questions. You have to catch a plane after that. Yeah, I've got to catch a plane. Yes. What date did you say when it was uh, Moby Dick? What date? What year? What year? Yeah, the original contract was in 1956, uh, the fall of 56. I don't remember exactly when, but it must have been around September, September, October. Uh, and it was delivered in December of 59. Well, it wasn't known as a fully solid state machine. It 
which is little known of the object of electronics. Yeah. Oh, I, this this was this was far from the first transistorized device. I think it was the first large-scale transistorized computer. Well, but a lot of transistorized stuff. Pardon? The LFA machine was a large-scale machine, uh, physically as well as logically. It was a, it was a computer. It was the size of a power steel five. The R LFE. LFE, Lamp Electronics. Who made it? They did. Who, who, what's the company? LFE belongs to Rockefeller. I guess I just don't know. Yeah. And uh, that was the problem. Okay, could so be. Yeah. We wanted to buy it. We used it West Electric. Uh -huh. And uh, because David Rockefeller was on the board of directors of AT and T, we weren't able to buy it. And this has been the first machine they built. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, I, I was not familiar. <coughs> that was yeah. a large disk. Yeah. yeah. Now we did not do a whole lot of invention of, of transistors, but the the. Uh, I thought the, the fact that this group here at, at Monmouth at, at the labs had actually dreamed up doing it that way, I thought it was very far-sighted. They, they were certainly ahead of their time. Okay, I guess we got to run. I got to go get the plane. Thank you all. Good. Thank you very much. No, no, it was great fun. It was a good group.